So, all right. So today I'll be talking on uh, this important topic, diarrhea in ICU, diagnosis and management. So this talk was uh, given by me in uh, Aurangabad in year 2015. Uh, so it's a important topic because seldom do we dwell into the details of diarrhea and diarrhea is a common problem in ICU and it is good to have a clarity on how we approach with regards to the causes and uh, how we approach the management. So let's look into the background. So what we need to understand is uh, diarrhea has uh, uh, you know a good impact on morbidity and mortality. So it does have a bearing on morbidity and mortality in ICU and it does increase the hospital length of stay and increases the cost for a patient when someone develops diarrhea in ICU. So if we look at the occurrence rate of diarrhea, so around 12 to 32 percent of the patients admitted to ICU when have diarrhea. And if you look at the Clostridium difficile infections, because we almost always uh, sort of uh, subscribe that uh, Clostridium difficile is the commonest cause of diarrhea in ICU, when they develop diarrhea in ICU. So but the Clostridium difficile infection, although it may occur commonly, it is less than 20 percent of uh, diarrhea that develop in ICU. So what are the definition of diarrhea? So the definition of this is ICU diarrhea which means diarrhea that has developed or acquired in ICU. So it is a nosocomial diarrhea. So definition is if they have more than or equal to three unformed stools and ICU diarrhea you call it as a nosocomial or ICU acquired diarrhea when it develops after three days of admission to ICU. So they should have been in ICU for equal to or more than three days of admission into ICU. So generally most diarrhea in ICU resolves uh, within few days. Okay? But there are certain diarrhea which can be protracted and which can be severe. So the diarrhea caused by Clostridium perfringens or Klebsiella oxytoca are found to be a lot more uh, sort of a, have a lot more morbidity and they may last for much longer time. And there are a lot of inflammatory colitis that can develop so that also can tend to last for longer time and can be severe. And uh, one important thing which I want the listeners to know is uh, the other commonest cause of ICU diarrhea is norovirus because this is the virus which has been attributed to cause outbreaks within ICU. And uh, most important other causes uh, due to all the chemotherapy drugs or cytotoxic drugs that, uh, that we use in ICU. So these are some of the commoner causes of diarrhea and which can be severe and which can be lasting for much longer period of time. So if you look at uh, the studies, I think this was a study done from US where they found that in when they did a study in 485 patients, the so nosocomial diarrhea, the occurrence rate or the incidence was around 12% and 27% of these diarrheas lasted for more than or equal to 3 weeks. So which means there are this distinct group of diarrheas which can tend to last much longer okay? and this may be due to some of the causes which I just said. And I think this is an important figure I want people to realize that anyone who is having hematological problems or who have received stem cell transplant, hematogenic stem, uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant, so 80% of these patients can be troubled with diarrhea. So this is something uh, I think all of us who may be dealing with stem cell transplant need to understand. And uh, further if you look at these studies, I think the occurrence rate of uh, ICU diarrhea in 1987 study which came from US was around 32%. And uh, another study which came in 1991 showed the occurrence rate is around 22 percent. So I think roughly if you put all these studies together around 12 to 32, 12 to 30 percent is the occurrence rate of diarrhea, nosocomial or ICU diarrhea. So I think what is the impact of this diarrhea, whether it is of any relevance because we know that diarrhea are common in ICU but we need to understand whether this has a serious impact on their clinical condition. So we do sort of recognize that when someone has diarrhea, it has a bearing on their hydration status and it has bearing on their electrolytes. And uh, it can lead to malnutrition because when they have chronic diarrhea, obviously you cannot feed them and their uh, feed tolerance also will be impaired. So the malnutrition may set in in patients who are having diarrhea. And what has been interestingly found is if someone has diarrhea, there is increased risk of other nosocomial infections like UTI and the bloodstream infections, catheter related bloodstream. So there is an increased risk of them having this. Possibly you could attribute it to maybe contamination happening in that area which has a bearing. Uh, 
and uh, maybe it uh, does uh, worsen the host defense mechanisms also. Mm -hmm. And another important impact of uh, diarrhea is it can limit the ongoing therapy because if someone has diarrhea, so there are certain drugs which may be attributing or causing diarrhea. So if it is antibiotic causing diarrhea, then obviously we may not be able to stop antibiotic or initiate new antibiotic if we believe antibiotic is the cause or if we believe there are chemotherapy drugs which may be causing diarrhea, so obviously we cannot stop this chemotherapy drug because that would have impact on the underlying disease or if someone is on immunosuppressants and if we attribute the diarrhea due to immunosuppressants we may not be able to stop it so what really it means is uh, if we have if the diarrhea is so refractory and we have to stop it then the underlying disease may sort of progress or may create problems and uh, a nutritional status also may be impaired because of ongoing diarrhea so when there is a diarrhea it may have impact on continuum continuation of certain drugs that patient may be on to limit their progression of their underlying disease and uh, this was a study which came from us where they found that in patients with solid organ transplant like kidney transplants the risk of rejection was found to be much higher when they have had nosocomial diarrhea so acute rejection uh, tends to happen and there can be graft loss and there is reduced graft survival when they have this nosocomial diarrhea so this was th so it had a good correlation with graft rejection possibly because the diarrhea per se if it is infective in origin that may have a bearing on the graft function so that is also something one needs to bear in mind when you are dealing with a transplant patients like diarrhea is not a simple thing it may have an impact on the graft rejection so overall i think as we said diarrhea has a bearing on morbidity mortality and does increase the hospital length of stay and does increase the hospital cost because the, they stay longer in icu the costs tend to increase so I think this is something I want you to understand. What is the pathophysiology in ICO acquired diarrhea? So what we need to understand is our normal gut, as you see, has around 10 trillion, uh, you know, microbial flora, what we call as microbiota. And what we have understood is this normal gut flora, I think the terminology we use now is microbiota. So this normal gut flora and our gut intestine they function in tandem and they have mutually beneficial sort of a adjunct roles to play so because this the normal gut flora supports the integrity of the mucosal epithelium and does improve the host defense mechanism so they work in a mutually beneficial way and they do participate both of them together work in tandem and help in digestion and they have a role in immune hemostasis and they have a role in metabolism and resistance pattern so basically they have they basically work in tandem and work in a very symbiotic way mm -hmm. to make sure all these things are happening so there are around 10 trillion microbiota so when we give antibiotics systemic antibiotics so there are multiple studies done you give any systemic antibiotic i think this symbiotic mechanism or the symbiotic mutually beneficial sort of interaction that prevails between the microbiota and the gut gets disrupted because of the antibiotic and that leads to a lot of uh, uh, genetic changes that happen within this microbiota so they call it as metagenome differences that exist and this leads to all the problems that develop because of your mucosal integrity that gets uh, uh, affected and increase the gut translocation and increase risk of other infections so what they found is so they have analyzed the DNA from the feces and they have tried to look at the changes that happen. So this particular sort of physiological studies they have done in patients who are receiving amoxicillin clavulanic acid and they have looked at the stools and the genetic sequencing. So what they have found is uh, in patients who have received antibiotics there is significant reduction in these gut microbiota. So the number of gut microbiota significantly comes down when systemic antibiotics are given and what has been found is this gut microbiota produces something called butyrates or butyric acid and this butyric acid is the nutrient for this intestinal epithelium and which maintains the integrity of this intestinal epithelium so when there is a reduction of this uh, gut microbiota there is reduction in the butyric acid or butyrate production and that leads to non-functional or uh, and it does affect the integrity of this mucosal epithelium and that leads to uh, 
uh, that facilitates uh, the mucosal barrier breach happens and there may be more gut translocation of pathogenic bacteria and all those deleterious effects can happen. And even they have found there is, uh, see this uh, bile acids is something which, uh, they, uh, which produces secretory effect on the gut epithelium or the so when there is a reduced metabolism of uh, bile acids that happens because of whatever changes that we see i think the increased presence of bile acids leads to secretory diarrhea so bile acids is an irritant and that leads to so because of these changes whatever antibiotic admission there is reduced metabolism of butyric acid that happens i mean with the reduced metabolism of bile acids that happen so all these lead to the problems which may precipitate onset of diarrhea in ICU. So let's look into the differential diagnosis. How do we approach, uh, what is the characteristics of ICU diarrhea? So one thing which all of us need to understand is any diarrhea in ICU, it is not always infectious. That is the first gospel we need to understand. And we need to understand there is a lot of asymptomatic carriers. I mean, all of us carry multiple microbia. And, uh, and not everyone would be symptomatic and so we may be asymptomatic but we may be carrying the bacteria which may not be manifesting and another problem is we do not have diagnostic tools for ascertaining the cause of diarrhea other than Clostridium difficile. So right now our tools are limited to determine that uh, this diarrhea may be due to Clostridium difficile but for non-Clostridium difficile organisms we do not have effective tests. So we'll talk about what are all the non clostridium difficile diarrheas that occur in ICU. But having said that, I told one of them is the norovirus. Norovirus also is found to be common. So right now, although any diarrhea prevails, I think our understanding is we need to rule out clostridium difficile. So I think recognizing the diarrhea may be due to clostridium difficile infection or norovirus is important. So these are the two agents which as per the literature we need to rule out even before we label it as non-infectious diarrhea. Okay, so <clears throat> as you see, if you look at the occurrence rate of Clostridium difficile, it's around 10 to 20 percent. So another important uh, microbia which causes diarrhea is Klebsiella oxytoca, so which uh, seldom we look into it. And this Klebsiella oxytoca produces toxins which inhibits the DNA synthesis and that has that can also cause refractory ICU diarrhea. And as you see, it, it, this Klebsiella oxytoca is the cause for 50 to 80 percent of non clostridial difficile infectious diarrhea. So if you look at the infectious as a spectrum, if clostridium difficile is 10 to 20 percent, I think the rest significantly is attributed by Klebsiella oxytoca and norovirus. Okay, so this is an interesting slide which is again from the literature if you see. So this is the normal gut flora changes that happen when antibiotic is administered. See, if you look at the spread of bacteria, day zero, pre-antibiotic, this is these are the uh, normal gut flora that is present. If you can read, there, there is a bacterial stragilis, bacterial whatever, diastolis and bifid. So all these bacteria, they change on day four of antibiotic. So that whole percentages change and day 24, there is a further change from what you see the spread. So here you have sort of uh, equivocal distribution and you see there is a skewed distribution. So what basically it reflects is when you give antibiotic, there is lot of alteration in the microbial normal flora that is present in the gut. So, so this was a study done from Austria. So they looked at uh, 107 patients with antibiotic associated diarrhea where antibiotic giving antibiotics has altered the gut flora and led to overgrowth of certain organisms. So if you look at bloody diarrhea, around 18 patients had bloody diarrhea and 89 patients had non-bloody diarrhea. So what this slide tells you is if it is a bloody diarrhea, 16.7% of the patients will have has have had Klebsiella oxytoca, but no Klebsiella oxytoca in non-bloody. So which means Klebsiella oxytoca what it essentially causes is a bloody diarrhea. So if you see blood in a ICU diarrhea, so you should think of Klebsiella oxytoca as a possible cause because that causes really bloody diarrhea. When you look at the algorithms which I will show you at the end, looking at how we approach diarrhea, mainly we divide into bloody diarrhea and non-bloody. So if it is non-bloody then you have certain causes. Bloody means I think some of the organisms you think is one of them is Klebsiella oxytoca. So and this was another study from Canadian uh, group where they looked at 429 stools and Klebsiella oxytoca was present in 2.3%. Okay. So and uh, the way 
uh, we try to approach diarrhea is again clinical features become important trying to see the quality of the stools and whether there is blood present and then we go through the diagnostic algorithms which we will talk about. So let's look into other also we have spoken about Klebsiella and uh, we have spoken a bit about what is the occurrence rate of Clostridium difficile. So what about Clostridium perfringens? So I think the percentage of it is 1 to 3 percent to 8 percent. So that is the sort of occurrence rate of Clostridium perfringens and the median duration at which Clostridium perfringens diarrhea happens is around 7 days. 7 days after they have been in ICU, I think uh, they can develop Clostridium perfringens and typically they can have more than or equal to 10 stools per day uh, in 1 out of 5 individuals. So if 5 people have infections, one of them would have more than 10 stools per day. Okay? So the way to diagnose Clostridium perfringens is to look at uh, immunoassays against this antigen and by reverse PCR techniques. So this is the available tools to diagnose Clostridium perfringens. So the other causes of other bacterial or other infectious causes of ICU diarrhea is the Staph aureus. Even it is been attributed MRSA can cause about 0.224% of ICU diarrhea. And Salmonella is also one of the cause but a little less in the order. So it will be Clostridium difficile infection, then Norovirus, Klebsiella oxytoca and then down the order Clostridium perfringens, Staph aureus and Salmonella. So what are the infectious causes not associated with antibiotics? So those are the infections which sort of tend to manifest after they have received antibiotics. So in ICU even without antibiotics there are certain infectious causes and that is norovirus. So as I said 5 to 30 percent is the occurrence rate of norovirus causing diarrhea in ICU and it accounts to the outbreak. So suppose in an ICU if 5 people develop diarrhea or more than you know there are significant proportions if there is an outbreak I think it accounts to 63 percent of the outbreaks so if you see a lot number of patients having diarrhea in ICU you should possibly think of virus as a cause and norovirus is one of them and the median duration is around three days it occurs usually after three days of ICU and there are other viruses also which causes ICU diarrhea like adenovirus, astrovirus and rotavirus so always keep virus in mind so ICU diarrhea is not equal to only Clostridium difficile it's not only bacterial because virus forms significant chunk of ICU diarrhea and that is something I think all of us need to have in mind but um, but I, I think we have to confess that I think in India we may not have diagnostic tests so we need to ascertain whether we have tools to identify this norovirus. So what are the additional infectious causes if you have dealing with an immunocompromise so all this time we have spoken about normal ICU patients and these are the infections. If you are dealing with immunocompromised patients, they also may be asymptomatic carriers of a lot of pathogens. The severity of diarrhea may be a lot more worse than immunocompetent host. I think one of the virus you would think in immunocompromised in addition to adeno, astro, rota and nora, nora virus also can happen is CMV. So CMV diarrhea is something that happens in immunocompromised. And we need to think of uh, parasites like Cryptosporidium is one of the parasites which we see in immunocompromised. And uh, then you would see uh, Giardia lamblia and you would see Campylobacter jejunalis. So these are some of the parasites which can occur in immunocompromised host. So we need to think of uh, CMV and we need to think of parasites Giardia, Campylobacter and Cryptosporidium. So these are the three things that has been listed as uh, possible reasons of chronic diarrhea and you have to think of strongyloids like in HIV strongyloids can cause uh, it's a worm so it can cause lethal problems and it can have multi-organ involvement so we need to keep uh, this also in mind strongyloids as one of the reason so the, those are the infectious causes in immunocompromised host so now we we'll look into medications and internal feeding as a cause of diarrhea so in ICU it has been said there are more than 700 drugs that uh, can cause diarrhea in ICU more than so literally any drug can cause diarrhea and that when you have to look at drugs drugs can cause inflammatory diarrhea and they can cause non-inflammatory diarrhea okay and in drugs antibiotics account for 25 percent of diarrheas so antibiotics are constitute 25 percent of drug induced diarrhea so other drugs are obviously we use laxatives in ICU so for possibly you know uh, facilitating their stool output so that remains the commoner cause along with it all the chemotherapy drugs we use uh, 
or any immunosuppressants azathioprine or any other immunosuppressant drugs that patient is on can lead to diarrhea most importantly we can't undermine sorbitol because sorbitol is an agent that is used as a solvent in many of the drugs and that itself may be contributing to some of the diarrhea in ic and even it is said just the fact that we are giving enteral nutrition as a bolus that itself may lead to 15 to 40% of the diarrhea or it can be due to contamination of the enteral feed that we give so if someone you attribute uh, the diarrhea due to enteral nutrition the recommendation is made that continuous infusion has to be tried out and if the diarrhea stops with continuous infusion as opposed to the bolus that we give then you may have to attribute the diarrhea due to bolus because some people may not tolerate bolus that's why what is encouraged is the continuous infusion of enteral nutrition because that can mitigate if it is a if the diarrhea, if the reason for diarrhea is the enteral nutrition per se causing diarrhea so i think this is the list of drugs that are in literature i have just highlighted the drugs which are possibly used in uh, icu so if you see uh, antiretrovirals uh, accounts to more than 20% of the diarrhea and acarbos which is used in some of the diabetics i think that causes more than 20% of diarrhea and see if you see the bigger percentages it comes in this group all the antibiotics or the cytotoxic chemotherapy drugs and immunosuppressants if you look at it azathioprine is something which uh, we do come across in icu tacrolimus or mycophenolate all these are used in transplant setting and if you see the occurrence rate 30 to 60% of them can have icu diarrhea and metformin which is a simplest drug that most patients would be on causes more than 20% so i have just highlighted uh, you know the offending drugs at a higher percentages okay so those are some of the commoner drugs and there are a lot of other drugs as you see like octreotide colchicine cholinergic drugs so literally any drugs can cause but these are some of the ones which have higher occurrence rate of diarrhea and even you have the psychiatric drugs like ssris which we tend to use more than 20% of them cause diarrhea and uh, even for obg patients where we use misoprostol that can also cause diarrhea so so and uh, what are the underlying conditions that may be leading to diarrhea so what we have looked is we looked at the infectious causes we have looked at uh, the drugs causing diarrhea we have looked at possible infectious uh, causes in immunocompromised but there are certain underlying conditions that patient may have may have which may manifest within icu and these underlying problems can be inflammatory bowel disease because patients may have inflammatory bowel disease which may get manifested in icu or patient may have irritable bowel syndrome or they can have lactose intolerance so if you are giving milk so that's why you would see when any patient in icu has diarrhea i think first thing at least we should do is to stop milk because they may have lactose intolerance that may be leading to diarrhea or you can have this uh, diabetic enteropathy so they may have as a pre existing entity and that can get worsened in icu and another important thing in icu is you know, the ischemic colitis because uh, when we are dealing with a very hemodynamically unstable patients or any patient with a vasculopath so i think there is a high risk of them having developed uh, sort of ischemic colitis and that itself can lead to diarrhea or as simple as if they have a fecal impaction they can have something called overflow diarrhea so where there is impacted feces and then you have entity called overflow diarrhea which can happen in icu so these are some of the underlying conditions which can present as diarrhea within icu and even i think this is an interesting thing it has been attributed that people with low albumin can have diarrhea so we don't know whether it's a result of causation or it's a correlation correlating effect so that we, are, we do not know for sure or it may be just that low albumin is just an indicator of their uh, poor outcome or their poor reserves which may be leading to diarrhea so that has not been established whether it's hypoalbuminemia just as a reflective of the severity of illness or whether it has a direct bearing on diarrhea and another important is graft versus host disease this we see in hematopoietic stem cell transplant and this can lead to refractory diarrheas in uh, patients who have developed stem cell transplant so these are all the underlying conditions which may remain on the background and which may be cause which may be worsening or causing diarrhea okay so they have looked at the time frame so what they found is patients who have a short stay in icu who possibly our mean length of stay in our icu would be around 3 to 4 days so if it is a short stay which is i would say it's less than 5 days your uh, percentage of diarrhea or icu diarrhea is less than 5% if you are dealing with a patient who is staying in icu for a much longer period of time they found that uh, diarrhea occur more commonly 15 to 80% of them staying for longer time 
developed area. So that is the correlation of uh, the duration of stay having a bearing on diarrhea. I think this is another interesting slide I wanted to focus on. If you look at Clostridium difficile as a cause of diarrhea uh, in antibiotic, patient receiving antibiotic, intensive care or chemo, as you see in all the subgroups, in all the subgroups, the occurrence rate is about the same. Patients receiving antibiotics 10 to 25 percent, intensive care 10 to 25, patient receiving chemotherapy 10 to 14 percent. But as you see, the causes of diarrhea exceed what, what you see striking is non-infectious causes. So non-infectious causes account to 70 to 90 percent of diarrhea in all categories, chemotherapy, even in solid organ transplant, 80 to 83 are non-infectious. I think this is one thing we should keep in mind that almost always it may be some drug that we are using which may be causing diarrhea or it may be an underlying problem. So we don't need to jump and start treating with multiple antibiotics for diarrhea in ICU because almost 80% significant proportion of the time it is non-infectious causes and Clostridium difficile only account for 10 to 20%. But we need to rule out. Having said that, we need to rule out. Once it's ruled out, at least be convinced that it is not infectious cause. Mm -hmm. So I think evaluation and management, I think this is important for uh, people to have clarity how we approach diarrhea. One thing is uh, we need to, when you are evaluating a patient with diarrhea in ICU, we need to assess the onset, when did the diarrhea begin and we need to look at the timing, when did the di diarrhea start after they have come to ICU and the severity of diarrhea. I think when we look at uh, the symptoms, what we have found is we need to see whether there is a concomitant vomiting. So if there is a vo concomitant vomiting, the Clostridium difficile is not found to have vomiting. So if there is vomiting, then you have to think of norovirus. So this is what uh, has been suggested. And if they have severe abdominal cramps, I think that is suggestive of inflammatory diarrhea. So so here you would think of more capital oxytoca diarrhea where it can cause severe abdominal pain. And obviously if you have blood in stools, then obviously you would think of inflammatory diarrhea or capital oxytoca diarrhea which causes blood in stools. And we have to look at dehydration and sepsis also as one of the coexisting uh, feature which may be causing di diarrhea. And what uh, we have understood is there is no validated criteria at this point of time to differentiate between Clostridium difficile and non-Clostridium difficile infection. So right now we do not have criteria to say this is, so we have to look into the symptomology and make some sort of an assumption maybe this is not Clostridium. If they have vomiting maybe it's not Clostridium. If they have bloody diarrhea, maybe it is uh, Klebsiella possibly is more likely than Clostridium difficile. So we do not have criteria, but as I have to reiterate, Clostridium difficile has to be excluded in any diarrhea that develops in ICU. That is something you need to know. So they have time and again emphasized on the importance of history. The reason why history is important is try to look at any other pre-existing diarrheal illness which may point out to pre-existing condition which may cause diarrhea or history of any drug intake or history of laxative abuse which may be you know predisposing them to diarrhea or history of any immunosuppressants they are on. So history becomes very important when we are dealing with diarrhea in ICU and uh, it is suggested that we need to look at the consistency of the stools, we need to look at the frequency of stools and volume of stools and uh, when you send stool for testing, so looking for uh, white cells or inflammatory cells in the stool is not found to be sensitive or specific. So because when we send stools you do get a report saying this many WBCs are found. So it is not of much relevance is what has been suggested in the literature. And checking for lactoferrin to look for lactose intolerance in only special cases you could consider not as a routine you would want to do that. In transplant patient, I think it is suggested we need to look for GVHD. I think the way we can look for graft versus host is to do biopsy, colonic biopsy to a certain. And in transplant, always we need to look at chemotherapy drugs and immunosuppressant agents which may be leading to diarrhea. That is something we need to have in mind. And in transplant, always look at possible CMV. And for establishing CMV, again we need to do colonic biopsies or we have to send CMV titers. And it is suggested that we need to look for the other viruses like uh, norovirus, adeno, rota, rotavirus and astrovirus. Okay. And in transplant we have to look for these parasites also, Giardia, Campylobacter and Strongyloids. So I think uh, for all the trainees I want you to focus on this algorithm. So how do we approach diarrhea? I think this is something which I find uh, 
it, which is useful for any of us working in ICU. If you have diarrhea, the first thing we need to see is we need to rule out these two things, whether it is Clostridium difficile or whether it is laxative induced diarrhea. So if there is laxatives, obviously we need to stop it. So once you say there is no laxative, so for, as you see the first step is to rule out Clostridium difficile. Once we say there is no Clostridium, the immediate next step is whether it is bloody diarrhea or non-bloody diarrhea. So this is the second step. Once we know it is non-bloody, then what we need to look at, we need to identify whether it is immunocompromised host or immunocompetent host or immunocompetent this immunocompromised host. If it is immunocompetent, so again we have to review all the medication patient is on because we have to, this is extremely important step, we need to look at any medicines which may be causing diarrhea. And in immunocompetent, it is said as per the algorithm, we need to do reverse transcriptase PCR to rule out norovirus. So once you say it's not Clostridium and once it's non-bloody, you have to look for norovirus. And you have to look at nutrition, how we are giving nutrition. So if you are nu giving nutrition as a bonus or if you are giving milk in the nutrition, maybe you have to consider stopping the milk in nutrition, maybe you have to switch to continuous infusion if you are giving boluses. Then after this, we need to look, rule out underlying disease. Any underlying disease, like if it is a very non-compliant diabetes, it may be diabetic enteropathy that may have made, or patient may have history of irritable bowel syndrome, or if there are impacted feces. So we have to look at underlying illness. And even if then you don't get an answer, you have to subject to colonoscopy because they need to do GI evaluation with endoscopy and colonoscopy to see what may be the cause and obtain biopsies. And management in immunocompetent non-bloody diarrhea, we have to again discontinue this uh, laxatives, optimize nutrition. When you say optimized nutrition is what I have already said. So we may have to change to continuous infusion and symptomatic treatment. So this is an approach to non-bloody immunocompetent. Immunocompromised, very similar, review again all the medicines. So every step you will see we have to keep reviewing the medicines. Again nutrition we have to review. So if it is non-bloody immunocompromised, I think uh, rotavirus somehow is, norovirus is somehow they have taken out. So they, they don't put emphasis on norovirus. Again we have to rule out underlying illness and after that you have to subject them to colonoscopy. Management is again same, discontinue uh, the laxatives and in immunocompromised, the suggestion is we have to adjust the chemotherapy drugs or immunosuppressant drugs if we believe that may be contributing and optimize the nutrition. So if you look at the flowchart, very similar but only difference is here you adjust the drugs and you may not look for norovirus immediately for non-bloody. So we look into bloody diarrhea. So if you look at bloody diarrhea, I think the evaluation is assess what is the amount of blood that is being lost and in bloody diarrhea they say you have to rule out ischemic colitis up front if there is and you have to look at Klebsiella as one of the cause but we do not have tests to look at Klebsiella oxytoca directly because cultures may not yield and immediately you have to subject them to colonoscopy to do biopsies and ascertain okay and if and you have to think of antibiotic associated hemorrhagic colitis as one of the cause so if there is any antibiotics I think that is something you may have to consider stopping. So AAHC is the antibiotic associated hemorrhagic colitis. Management is again discontinue all the laxatives, monitor obviously hemoglobin and monitor ongoing blood losses, symptomatic treatment. As you see in blooded area, antibiotic associated hemorrhagic colitis and ischemic colitis top the list. So we have we would be compelled to discontinue antibiotics. So if there is hemorrhage, I think that's the key thing we need to have in mind that it may be antibiotics. So antibiotic associated hemorrhage but is not a simple thing. So if there is blood, Klebsiella oxytoca is one thing and antibiotic associated hemorrhagic and ischemic quality. These three we have to rule out and discontinuing antibiotics is what is suggested in the algorithm. As I've said, there are no tests to detect Clostridium perfringens as of now routinely. Klebsiella oxytoca in the stools or Staph aureus in the stools. So it is hard to detect determine these bugs as a cause for ICU diarrhea. So treatment of any ICU diarrhea, I think what we currently do and what is also recommended is you treat, you don't wait for establishing, obviously you start treatment for Clostridium difficile. After obviously sending for Clostridium difficile toxin and other tests to rule out Clostridium difficile. And it is supportive therapy, we would give fluids, we would uh, correct all the electrolytes. When I say electrolytes, it's not only sodium potassium chloride, we have to look at calcium, magnesium, phosphorus because phosphorus losses may be happening. We need to replenish that. 
and if it is Clostridium difficile or norovirus, we need to isolate this patient because as you saw, norovirus can cause outbreaks. Clostridium difficile also has a, you know, it has, patient has to be isolated to curtail the spread of this infection. And I think this is another important thing which I want trainees to understand. If it is immunocompromised, probiotics you should not give because obviously they are immunocompromised, probiotics may lead to overgrowth of organisms. So we have to use it in caution, make sure they are immunocompetent. If they are immunocompromised, we don't use. I think that is the standard of care which we all do. And anti-diarrheal drugs is what uh, could be considered to stop the diarrhea, anti-diarrheal agents. Okay? So this is the sort of approach to treatment. So what about the future directions? I think what the problem we have, I think in India or anywhere, we need to define the epidemiology in the places we work to determine what may be the common cause of diarrhea that are happening. And we need to understand the role of microbiome. Microbiome is all the microbiota and how we need to take steps to not to disrupt the microbiota because microbiota is a very protective in nature. As you see, it has a role in metabolism, it has a role in immune hemostasis, it has a role in digestion. So we need to protect this and uh, relentless um, or inappropriate use of antibiotics can harm this microbiome. So that is something we need to keep in mind. And right now as we speak, there are only guidelines uh, which is there only for approach of Clostridium difficile infections. We do not have clearly laid out guidelines for approaching other infectious diarrhea in ICU. So we need to standardize criteria for establishing diagnosis, assessing the severity and managing these patients in a more homogeneous way. So the summary of my talk is, I think all of us need to understand ICU diarrhea is common and it is underemphasized or underappreciated. So again, I made in summary, Clostridium difficile is an unlikely cause. So as a, why, the reason I say unlikely is it only contributes to 10 to 20 percent. The significant chunk, we have to look for other causes. So it's an unlikely cause for all the diarrheas. And again, as I said in fever, non-infectious causes remain the commonest source of, commonest cause of diarrhea and It's always non-infectious. And the infectious may be due to almost always, as you see, 80 percent, even if you see, if you recall those charts, 70 to 80 percent of the time is due to the drugs. It may be due to the drug toxicity, it may be due to the adverse effect of the drugs or it may be antibiotics causing disruption of the gut flora or gut microbiota. And what we all need to understand is diarrhea has a significant bearing on morbidity and mortality. Together they do, they do increase hospital ICU length of stay and do increase the ICU cost. And uh, what we need to work towards is to have algorithms, uh, have a sort of a protocols in each ICU, how to approach diarrhea in ICU and how to establish diagnosis and how to manage diarrhea in ICU. Thank you very much. So I'll end with this quote. So collaboration is far more powerful than competition. So body and brain work best when you're joyful and peaceful, not when you're pushed to the wall by Sadhguru. Thank you.